You know, there are beings, earthlings, that are often overlooked but offer more amazement than some of the creatures we can make up. A bee is one of those beings. It is the super being of its kind. And I'm going to show you why. I'm going to give you a look into their lives. I'm going to show you how their population may affect our population. And I'm going to show you some of the secrets of these magnificent creatures and the superfood they create, honey. We will look into the workings of their natural technologies and you will see just how advanced these beings are as we step into the secret lives of bees. Worldwide, there are some 20,000 species of bees. They are believed to have originated in Africa, a descendant of the ancient wasp, and are today found almost everywhere flowers exist. Now there are two classes of bees, social and solitary. And within those two classes, there are only a few that people commonly encounter. In the social class, there are bumblebees, honeybees, and Africanized honeybees. The carpenter, digger, mining, yellow-faced bees, leaf-cutting and mason bees, plasterer bees, sweat bees, these are all solitary. For the purpose of this presentation, I will be discussing the social class that form large colonies, particularly the common honeybee. Now these bees are community builders. They will build a colony to its peak population and then the queen, along with 30 to 70% of her workers, form a swarm and leave the hive to find a new home. The youngest generation are left behind in the old hive to start over. This is how colony bees reproduce, one colony at a time. Each one different from the first. Now what happens inside the hive, my friends, is something amazing. What you have inside the hive is a caste system in which you have three types of bees, the female queen and worker bees, and the male drones. The way this works is, the queen controls the sex of the bees in the colony. After she takes in the sperm of a drone, she can store it in her spermatheca, which is a holding sac in her reproductive system. This allows the queen to later decide which eggs she will fertilize and which eggs she will not. If the eggs are left unfertilized, they are haploid, meaning they have a set of unpaired chromosomes. These will become the male drones. If on the other hand the queen fertilizes the eggs, they will become diploid, creating a female queen or worker. It is the diet of the female larva that will determine if she becomes a queen or worker. If she is well fed, she will become a queen. If she is starved, she will become a worker. Now a queen can live up to five or six years, but they normally live up to two or three years in the colony. During that time, the queen may lay up to around 500,000 eggs. When she does this, she releases a pheromone that keeps the other female bees from laying eggs, although a few colonies may end up with more than one queen. Now because drones are the result of unfertilized eggs, they have no fathers, but they do have grandfathers. Their lives are not really that great as all they are required to do is eat and mate with the queen bees. Now I know to some that sounds like a pretty sweet deal, but the life of a drone is you either mate or die. And even when they do mate with a queen, that kills them. You see, drones will leave the colony to go congregate with other drones. When the queen leaves the hive, she will come across one of these congregations. When the drones see her, they give chase and the fastest drone wins. The winning drone, poor sap, will mount the queen and release his endophallus into the queen, causing the drone to fall back paralyzed. The queen will then take in the drone's semen and store it in her spermatheca. After the queen is done with him, 
the drone falls dead. Now that's what I call a climax. Anyway, this is where things get crazy. Often after this process, the drone's endophallus will detach from its body and is left hanging out of the queen. This is called the mating sign. And this lets other drones know that this queen is a prime candidate for mating. In fact, the queen will go through 20 plus endophalluses before the day is up. She will actually take in a drone's semen, making him think he's the one, and then after he's dead, she releases all his semen and moves on to the next drone. And what sucks is that most drones don't even get a shot at the queen before they die. Now the reason the queen does this is to increase the chances of getting healthy semen as well as ensuring diversity among the colonies and to prevent inbreeding. Which is why it is important to have one queen per colony. However, on an occasion, a hive may end up with more than one queen. Normally, the worker bees do not lay eggs with a healthy queen present, but if the queen is failing or if she is missing, workers may step up to lay unfertilized eggs creating drones with the semen that could preserve the genetics of their colony. So because workers do not lay eggs, they take on several tasks in and outside the hive throughout their lifetime, which is around six weeks. These workers go through four main stages. After the worker bee emerges from its cell as an adult, it starts out as a cleaner and capper. Their job is to clean the dirty cells and learn how to cap or cover the cells with wax using their newly developed wax glands. They also have a way of branding each cell to let other bees know what's inside the cell, sort of a bee writing system. They also learn how to get food and after a few days, the workers move up to become nurses, where they tend to the brood and queen, basically keeping the brood and queen fed with royal jelly. Royal jelly is a secretion of nutrition from the worker bees of the hive, this is fed to all the larvae to a certain point and then they are cut off. Only the chosen queen will continue to be fed the royal jelly. So after this nurturing stage, the workers begin to put more into building the hive. This is where they become the honeycomb builders, packers, cleaners, and movers. They take and handle the nectar from incoming foragers, passing it along to one another. They become the honey producers and then they become the wax producers, the cappers of the honeycomb cells. They begin to take orientation flights at around 18 days of age, mind you. Kids grow up so fast these days, don't they? They leave the hive, circle it, and travel a short distance, then return. And each time they do this, they travel a little bit further out. Each hive has a distinct odor. This helps bees of the colony to identify their hive, but sometimes workers can drift and sometimes they wind up in a hive that is not their own not a good day for that bee but these orientation flights prepare them for their next and final duties guarding and foraging now because every hive has a distinct odor so do the bees that belong to that hive so the guard bees will actually post up outside the hive like royal guards and assess everything trying to enter the hive and making sure that outsiders do not get in. You see, bees use several methods to communicate. One of them is by dance, which are rhythmic signals to other bees. These dances have numerous functions, including providing information about what is going on outside the nest. They can triangulate locations by coordinating their dances to line up with the sun. This can give away the position of food and predators. They can see a bear or man coming in the distance, report back to the hive that some type of monster is coming for their honey, and then they will take action. Because remember, they have their own enemies. For example, the yellow jacket. Oh, this dude is bad news. Honeybees don't have an easy life, folks. These yellow jackets are just social wasp. They build colonies just like honeybees, except the yellow jacket has a taste for flesh. And when their food supply runs low, which tends to happen going into the fall season, guess who they are going to pay a visit to? The honeybees? Us? Ever have one try to take some of your coffee or food? They can be quite aggressive. They are actually trying to rob you with a potentially deadly weapon. 
and these are the ones that like to sting you. And yes, they can be the criminals of the bee kingdom. They will attack and invade a hive. They will kill the guards, kill the workers, eat the young, and steal the honey. And hornets, these other wasps, they're no better. They run around all day kidnapping poor green grasshoppers and then throw them into their prison half dead so that they can keep them fresh until it's time to feed them to their young. Now, of course, I'm making it sound worse than it is. They do play in an important role in the circle of life. But moving on, the foragers of the honeybees are the elders of the colony at 21 days of age. They are the ones that go out into the world to collect four things. Pollen, which they use as a protein source. Nectar, which is their carbohydrate or sugar source. Propolis, which is tree resins used for building materials and medicine for the hive. And water, used for hydration as well as cooling and evaporation for the hive. This is also one of the ingredients they need to produce honey. Now, bees have to slave to make this honey. The foraging bee usually collects nectar from some 100 flowers before returning to the nest. One bee can only make about one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey within its entire lifetime. So it takes around 550 plus bees collecting nectar from around 2 million flowers for one pound of honey. What they do is they will suck the nectar from the flowers, store it in a separate stomach, and once full they carry it back to the nest to pass it along to one of the honey producers in the hive. They chew on the nectar mixing it with enzymes and start to blow bubbles with it to start what's called active evaporation. And they will keep passing this nectar on to other bee producers for a good 20 minutes until it is ready to be placed in one of the hexagonal cells. Once it is placed in the cell, it is still wet. So the bees will start passive evaporation by fanning the honey with their wings. Finally, they will cap the honey with a wax layer for storage. Now I want everyone to understand that these types of bees are almost completely dependent on the power of the sun. Think about this. In the hive as a collective, they are warm-blooded creatures living in a temperature-controlled hive. Individually, outside the hive, they are cold-blooded. Try figuring that one out. And the honey they produce is one of the most miraculous superfoods that exist. First off, it is the only food that virtually never goes bad. You could take a chunk of honey from the tombs of Egypt and eat it. All you have to do is heat it up. With that said, it is a great prepper's food source. You know, honey is better than any antibiotic out there. You can use it topically and not only will it kill the bacteria, but it will keep the bacteria from building up immunity against it. But it must be raw honey, straight from the hive into the jar. That little bear-shaped bottle of brown honey, that stuff has been massively processed and pasteurized, heated up to kill bacteria. Did you hear what I just said? Commercial honey suppliers, they heat up, or should I say, cook the crap out of bacteria-killing honey so they can kill the bacteria. If you do use honey, make sure it is raw. Make sure it is locally grown as you want to support local beekeepers and those colonies in the area. Also, the pollen collected by the bees in your area is the same pollen that you breathe in. So eating honey from the same source as the pollen will help build immunity to the pollen, relieving allergies. Honey is a great energy booster as the natural unprocessed sugars hit the bloodstream quickly. Honey helps keep the memory intact as it is loaded with antioxidants needed to keep the brain sharp, at the same time helping the brain to absorb calcium. It will also help carry other nutrients to the cells in your body. Honey can also aid in helping you get to sleep. It can suppress coughs. It has antifungal and anti-inflammatory properties. So it is good for scrapes and burns. It can relieve sores, herpes. See the enzymes draw fluid from the sores and cut microorganism growth. And as the honey mixes with small amounts of 
natural hydrogen peroxide in your body, it is much better than any prescription or non-prescription medication you can buy. Use it on your skin. You can mix honey with something like an olive oil or rose oil or almond oil and make a moisturizer, hair conditioner. Add some crushed almonds to it and now you have a facial scrub. And honey will take care of that acne problem. It will boost the immune system. It fights cancer cells, yeast infections, gum disease. It relieves acid reflux. And it is a natural aphrodisiac. I mean, folks, this stuff is a real gift from God, made by a tiny insect raised under the power of the sun. In a sense, it is truly liquid gold. So now that we've gotten through Honeybees 101, I want to discuss something that could develop into a major issue in the future if we are not careful. As you may very well know, we have been having some issues with the decline in bee populations. This has been going on since the mid-40s, but it did not really catch people's attention until about a decade ago. So let me tell you how important bees are. The majority of the vegetation you eat is dependent on bee pollination. When you have a field of flowers and trees, the wind will only contribute to about 20% of the pollination. When you throw bees in the mix, pollination goes from 20% to 100%. Because bees are so efficient, they get to every single flower. We've been trying to achieve this by hand. It cannot be done. Farmers often need to keep beehives around their crops, increasing their yield more than three times over. Now the biggest problems for bees right now is inbreeding, parasitic mites, which attach themselves to a bee to suck their blood, weakening the bee, when the bee already has a lot of traveling and work to do. Can you imagine having a bug the size of a basketball stuck to your back, drinking your blood all day, and you still have to travel to work, do your job, and come back home to do more work with this thing stuck to you? What's amazing, now beekeepers have been able to introduce a much smaller insect to the bee population, which will go inside the bees and eat the mites without hurting the bees at all. And because of this, many beekeepers have been able to increase their numbers significantly. Bees are also threatened by pesticides such as neonicotinoids. See, what happens is this chemical gets into the ground. Some seeds, in fact, are coated with a thin layer of this pesticide, which is basically a dose of nicotine. The flowers become loaded with this stuff and in high doses, it will just kill any bee that takes nectar from that flower. If it is a low dose, it will cause the bee to basically get high. They become disoriented and have trouble returning to the nest. And the problem is once they do make it back to the hive, they contaminate other bees. And because of the fact that this is an addictive substance, the bees who have had a taste of it now only want to go to the flowers that have this chemical. Once they have this stuff in them, they are hooked. And yes, this stuff does make it into our vegetation, a type of nicotine, and it is very hard to detect. But Japan has been able to use technology to actively test for this in humans, and they have discovered some very interesting things. Now frequencies, microwaves, cell phone towers, satellites, Wi-Fi, electromagnetic radiation, these things of course affect every living thing to various degrees. So yes, they are going to affect bees. The change in the resonant frequencies of the earth are going to affect bees. To what degree we really don't know. So it may cause drifting, disorientation, mutations in the colony, changes in bee behavior, leading to reductions in population. I mean, in humans, these things increase our risk of cancer. The real conspiracy comes in when they try to hide the data, showing the direct effects of these things on bees. Bees are very sensitive to frequencies. Many of the things they do are rhythmic. For example, they do not flap their wings like birds, they beat them meaning they move them a certain number of beats per second. Did you know that when extracting pollen, in order to get the pollen out of the stamen, the bee will beat its wings to match the note of C and literally vibrate or shake the pollen out of the stamen. Now when they are in flight, it is around 230 beats per second. 
Now, if you didn't know, there are several theories on how this insect can fly, still. It is not as simple as creating wind pressure under their wings, like a helicopter. I mean, they still don't even know what they use their antenna for. But one of these theories is this. In between the wings of the bee, there is a hollow cavity. As the bee beats its wings, the cavity builds up a field of energy. Once that frequency matches the resonant frequencies around the bee, that bee can now defy gravity. It sounds a bit nuts, but this is why I discuss frequency a lot. You should have a better understanding. So now, the bee can become a free agent, allowing them to carry the extra weight of nectar, pollen, water, and propolis. They create a magnetic bubble around them, so they can travel freely in straight lines at speeds of up to 30 miles per hour without the interference of wind. Do you know how fast that is for a creature that small? Has anyone ever heard of Viktor Grebenikov? He was a Russian scientist, entomologist, who invented a levitation platform using the wings of beetles. See, Grebenikov would observe a certain type of beetle that he would not give the name of, by the way, for conservation reasons, but he noticed that the beetle, despite its lack of aerodynamics, was able to fly in very odd, zigzag-like patterns. It could not fly very well, but it could hover no problem. So what he did was he tested the wings. He observed them under a microscope. He also noticed that these wings would move under certain conditions. So he then took as many of the wings he could find, and he arranged them in a grid pattern on a flat surface or board. He discovered that any object he placed over the board, such as a pencil, would fly right off. If he flipped the board over, the board would hover. He then took this to the next level by building a platform he could stand on with handlebars with the insect wings underneath it. The handlebars were attached to four fan mechanisms underneath the board, which would change the direction of where the force was pushing so that he could control his movement. He claims that the energy field that built up around this device had built up to become so big that he could travel at speeds of close to 1,000 miles per hour without running into anything or creating any wind resistance because he says there was some type of anti-gravity field around him that would protect him and allow him to be a free agent, similar to the theory of bee flight. You see folks, shapes have energy. They resonate frequencies. A good example of this is the pyramid. The shape of a pyramid, for example, even just the frame alone, will create a double helix spiraling energy vortex out of the top of the pyramid and a magnetic field surrounding the entire pyramid. Now you can experiment with this at your home. You may want to look through the book Shape Power by Dan Davidson where he breaks down the exact science of this and also explains the application of this technology for free energy, healing, the creation of electromagnetic fields that can block out radiation levitation or anti-gravity technology. Also imagine the effects this tech would have on the human psyche. This technology can be used by gardeners to enhance the growth of their plants, and there are several other applications of this which I may discuss later on. The point is this. You look at something like a bee, and like many things, you forget their importance. You forget why they were worshipped by the ancients. You forget that technologies are being developed, inspired by these creatures. There are many things about them that we do not understand. We are still learning. Honey has more benefits that I have not discussed that we still do not know what they are. Bees are one of the most organized beings on the planet. In time, we may discover even more secrets about their lives. But let's stay conscious of their numbers at this point, because if they fail, at our population numbers, we are sure soon to follow.